Uh, how you guys doing? My name's Greg. I work for Draft House Films. Uh, I love this movie, and I could not be happier with the decision that you guys decided to make for your Sunday evening, because it's a, been a beautiful weekend in Austin, Texas, and the only way that you can punctuate a perfect weekend is by seeing probably one of the most incredible films that your eyes will ever see. Uh, this movie is one of the most bizarre things that I've ever seen, because it's essentially what feels like a G-rated movie in an incredibly hard R world. Uh, it, it is, it's one of those things where like, we live in a world where people watch YouTube videos and you kind of get on the edge of your seat going like, what's going to happen next? And you have like an accelerated heartbeat and that lasts for about two to three minutes or whatever your attention span is at the time. This movie is a constant reinvention of creating that tension for 97 animal mauling minutes of perfection. Uh, and there's, like, it's 100% climax. So uh, hopefully you guys desperately enjoy this beautiful 11 years in the making, like monstrous achievement of, and I, I guess that's a fun pun, uh, of cinema. But uh, this screening is unlike any other because uh, we have a man who is a jack of all trades on the set, including being one of its stars, and he's going to be here for a Q&A afterwards. Uh, he asked me to not refer to him as this, but I'd like to introduce you guys to John the Lion Tamer Marshall. <laughs> Well, we we're tamed or trained, so that's inaccurate. <laughs> Maybe afterwards? The, the lion survivor. <laughs> Do they have like a help group for that? It's just you sitting on a couch drinking a beer. You're like, oh, I'm a, the lion survivor's anonymous group. I, I never got an, uh, another job offer with the lion uh, survivor after this. Thank God. I would never have done it anyway. But uh, what, what you're going to see should never have happened. <laughs> in, in hindsight, if we knew even half of what we knew when, when we did this thing, we would, we would have all just said, forget it. We're never going to be involved. But when we, once we started it, you couldn't uh, uh, not finish it um, because we had so much money tied up in it. We had every every home we owned, we we sold them and put everything into this, and then uh, it never got released in America until Tim Lee found it. And it's been in my garage. And, and when my son sent me an email about five weeks ago, and he said. Uh, Dad, you know, uh, Draft House is releasing it in theaters. And I said, what's a Draft House? <laughs> and he was all excited. And I go, well, I decided to call somebody else up and say, it's coming out in theaters? Well, come on, who would? And, and so I'm so glad. I'm glad that uh, you, because this is the way it should be seen, not a TV. Well, it, well, it never played in the U.S. whenever it's it directed. never played release. in the U.S. I, I did the, uh, I promoted it in Australia for 30 days. I went to a different city every day. And we went in England. We sold almost every country in the world, just never America. And we're 30 years late, but we're happy at Draft House Films to be the first people to ever let American audiences see and this film. Tim has marketed it properly because it didn't do well in Australia, it didn't do well in England because the, 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 the slogan was uh, Roar, it had the, a white button with a, a red thing and it had four little tiger cups on top of the, the letters and then it said a fur, F-U-R-R-R, -R -R, ferocious comedy. So it was marketed as a family film. This is not a family film. We thought it was because we were a family. We were wrong. Tim is right. This is the most dangerous film ever done. If anybody tried to do it, they would shut a movie down in Hollywood if you had three people get hurt. 72 people got hurt. And this was back before there were many lawyers and litigious stuff and stuff. But uh, So uh, with that said, uh, I'll say about the other things for you. You might have a few questions afterwards. So enjoy. You're going to have a shitload of questions afterwards. Thank you guys so much for being here. Oh, oh, there we go. That's my How you guys doing? You guys like Roar? How the fuck are you guys going to watch Jurassic Park later this year and care? Give it up for probably the bravest man that I've ever met, Mr. John Mark. So, I'm going to start this off by asking you a degree of varying intelligent questions, uh, and then, I mean, they're going to be really stupid, uh, and then you guys can hopefully ask all your stupid questions after me, uh, but please, if you are going to raise your hand, make sure that whatever you have to say is in the form of a question, and not necessarily just a statement that you want to be said in front of a room full of people. Uh, and so just if it's like, that was cool, like, just go, that was cool? Uh, so I think it's a question. Um, but I guess... <laughs> This is the weirdest home movie I've ever seen. Uh, and, and I guess whenever you watch Roar and then you start to learn the history of Roar, which is a really prolific history, like how much of this movie is kind of a home movie and how much of it is deeply focused narrative? 
Well, well, none of it was really a home film because it, it, when we were at home living with him, it was uh, it was more like the end of the film because we were enjoying them and, and, you know, if they, if they bitch you, you hit them and you're just like a dog, you know, they, they, you're raising them. <laughs> so there was not much home movie in this. This was... Uh, a dog can't eat my face. <laughs> <laughs> Some dogs could. <laughs> but, but I mean, like, uh, in, in a home movie sense, I mean, like, it was such a large part of your life. Like, you were in this movie in pre pro Only 11 years. Yeah. Like, how much of it do you look back on it and kind of see it as this, this history of your life and how much can you just kind of sit back and enjoy it as a narrative of a movie. I don't think I enjoy it because I, I uh, for the for you know it's been like 34 years since it was in the theater in Australia, so I would only watch it like once or twice a year on a DVD, and I typically would have nightmares for a day or two, so I, I don't watch it all that often. And then, uh, what are the contexts where you're like, you know what, I'd really love a nightmare this week, and you pop it into the DVD player, or is it just like whenever you're hanging out with your buddies drinking beer, you guys, you guys will never fucking believe this. Well, no, mostly it was a, I met somebody new, and, and I said, you know, we'd go out on a date, and I'd say, you know, um, sometimes I'd watch it w with them, but other times I'd say, well, you know, if you want to go out on a second date, you should watch this movie because um, I'm a little unusual, and so you should see what what I did, and and see if you would even want to think about going on a second date. Well, and, and so, I mean, uh, this, this was your first movie, really, right? I was a kid act. I started when I was five. But, like, but the first production, yeah. really heavily involved, and then you've gone on to do commercials and stuff like that. Like, how do you ever top Roar? Like, are you always kind of, like, are you a junkie at this point where you're just constantly chasing that high? Um, and it took me a lot. I hope that this is a yes probably answer. It took me six or seven. It was a yes or answer. And so it took me six or seven years to figure out that I needed to replace the danger because I, I was a danger. It was a, I was a danger junkie. And so you, it, it was always life and death, and it was so intense, and you'd live it, and, and it, it, got you, it, it got you excited. So I, I started doing the most dangerous things I could do in commercials and any other production. And, and until I had kids, and then I kind of replaced with financial danger. And so I do that. <laughs> Seems not as exciting. But still, I, I, I still do things that are like everybody. And I've done like crazy, crazy things in, in many productions through the years, movies and commercials. And people say, well, no, you shouldn't do that. And I go, well, but I used to beat up lions and tigers for a living, so this is easy. So every, in comparison to beating up lions and tigers and surviving this, anything else is easy. <laughs> and so what's scarier, fighting a lion or a tiger or like that insane motorcycle stunt that you did? Well, the motorcycle bit, the, the, the off the Who the fuck says that? <laughs> the only thing that was hard about the motorcycle is you just, I talked to a couple friends of mine, stunt guys, and they said, John, that, that, that's easy, so just make sure, well, because the lake was only five feet deep. So <laughs> that seems even scarier. You're describing a scarier situation now. Well, but it was like six inches of soft mud. But so they, they all said, the main thing you do is just make sure you, you, you don't land on that bike because if you went and landed on the bike, it kind of hits you in the crotch and it'd be real bad. So he said, just throw it away from you. And so that was all that, and that was easy. Um, <laughs> getting bitten was, it, because it really hurt all the time. I mean, I don't know if you saw when I was on the motorcycle coming down the, the hill, they're like, they're not biting in terms of like canines in your leg, muscles ripping in hospital trips because the 70 injuries, <clears throat> the injuries didn't count unless you went to the hospital. So, uh, so canines usually in the muscle, that was like a hospital. But usually they just, they nip at you, but they like draw blood and it really hurts, but it was no hospital. Um, and they, they, but they did that a lot. And so there were scenes that, uh, and this sounds a little strange because, uh, but it was very usual. Nothing about this conversation is going to sound normal to me. <laughs> okay, well, it seemed normal when, when, with us at the family. Hey, and, and so like a good day acting was, we get together and say, hey, what do you think about that scene or something? And you go, hey, it's pretty good. We're not in the hospital. <laughs> so the short answer is, uh, the, <laughs> the scariest thing that you did on set was riding a motorcycle while being chased and bitten by tigers. <laughs> oh, no, that was, the motorcycle wasn't that bad. <laughs> Uh, but so, at what point in your life, uh, obviously I'm assuming this is post-roar, where you realized that you had a really unusual upbringing? 
Oh, I knew it from the very beginning because I was like the coolest kid in high school. Uh, I, I had lion cubs and tiger cubs at home when I was 15. I mean, like everybody wanted to come over and hang out at my house. So we knew it was unique very early on, but, but do you survive this and have this? Yes, it was right afterwards. I mean, do you look back on it all the time and just realize that you dodged a, like a bullet that was shooting at you for 11 years? I don't, I, I never read, because if, if I thought I was gonna die ever, uh, that was the kiss of death because then you would be. So you had to believe that you could beat him up and that you were in charge and, and if you showed any fear in, I mean, we acted afraid, but if you were really afraid, you were dead meat. I mean, was anybody that was an actor like legitimately afraid? Because I feel like I saw a lot of terror in that movie. <laughs> well, no, because the family, we, we, I mean, we were afraid at different, like Melanie would come up to me and say, hey, because nobody, my father was, it was, it was very intense. And so nobody could stand up to my father except I would because I got to a point where I didn't give a shit because, you know, he was going to yell at me anyway. And so I'd go in and I'd say, I, I remember I had a conversation. I said, Dad, so Melanie came to me and, and she's really afraid of this one scene that we're doing. And so she's really afraid of this one particular lion. So can we do this scene without that lion? He goes, well, she shouldn't be afraid. And I said, okay, Dad. Um, I know you don't have any fear and you don't understand fear, but I, I took psychology at UCLA and fear is in somebody's mind and you can't tell them not to have it. They have it, so we need to address this and maybe we could finesse it and, and tell her we won't use this lion or we'll do this to make her feel a little better. And he goes, well, that's stupid. Just tell her not to be afraid and come on, we gotta shoot the scene. I think legitimately- Great directing. In a dictionary next to fear. Great, great parent. It's like scared, averse, and then like at the bottom of it is like, like a tiger coming after you is fear. <laughs> But I mean, so so obviously you have uh, a very unique relationship with the movie. Like you're you're here, you're, you're doing a Q and A. Like have you, like over the span. Notice of, I'm the only one. But over the span of Roar existing, like he said, you'd watch it a couple times a year. You'd go out on a date and say, check this movie out if you want to learn some stuff about me. Like what what is the rest of the family's relationship with the movie? Like do you guys ever talk about it? Is it a, like is it that weird thing that happened to like your family that you're like, yeah, there was that time that we made that lion movie. <laughs> like, what is everybody else's relationship with it? I, I did a documentary uh, about the making of Roar with Tippy, and uh, she's not promoting the film because it's everything, uh, uh, her, her uh, rescue and, and what she's doing with the animals is, is it's, they're wild animals, they shouldn't be with people, this should never be done, so the board of directors won't let her promote the film or talk about the film or anything else. So needless to say, we don't all get around together and go, well, that was pretty stupid. Uh, so we don't, we don't really discuss it. But yeah, so do you know if anybody's ever, like, if any of your family members have watched Roar? Oh yeah, no, I, I know absolutely, because I went out on a limb when I transferred it to DVD, I don't know, 15 years ago, and I sent a copy to Melanie. I didn't know what her reaction was gonna be, and, and like two weeks later, she sent me an email back. She goes, can I get 20 copies of that? So clearly she, she didn't think it was that bad. What did she want 20 copies for out of curiosity? Probably just to give her, her kids. <laughs> Uh, yeah, does somebody have a question? Uh, so um, John is going to deem your question to be poster worthy because we have uh, some. Of the, we have these really nice theatrical roar posters, so we have a, a handful of them to give away. If you guys have a good question, and then I think the best question, John, did you want to give it away? We have a roar T-shirt also. Um, where is this roar shirt from? Did you did you bring this? Yeah, like ten years ago. I mean, we we made like so many. Uh, if this was released everywhere in the world. Every country had a different T-shirt or something, and this is one that uh, we did years ago. And so I, I brought uh, the, there were like twenty left that I had. So we I, I brought them here because uh, uh, they're I fucking them, awesome. By the way. <laughs> I mean, it's it's I'm still amazed that. Uh, I'm like here talking in a theater and people watching this movie. <laughs> it, was, it was a long time ago. Do you have fun watching it now? I mean, I know you said it's I'm like, with, with, with the crowds that are understanding it now. Well, it, like I said five weeks ago when I first heard that it was being released in theaters, but for two weeks uh, I had nightmares and then finally <laughs> I got uh, uh, desensitized. And I, I sleep perfectly well now. I don't dream. I, I love it. I love seeing the reactions. I like talking about it because it was batshit crazy. And, and I finally get to, it, like, 
I lived. Uh, I have great memories of this thing, and um, and to, to hear everybody just have such a great time, and 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 it, it's really really exciting. Yeah, somebody with a question. Yeah, right here. Yep. How much did you have to feed all these, uh, all the lions and tigers every day? Between five and ten pounds a day, the leopards and and the smaller cats would get five. Uh, lions and tigers would get ten to twelve. So there were 150 of them. I don't know, 2,000 pounds, 1,500 pounds a day. It was a guesstimate. There was a lot of biting on the on the set. Yeah. Uh, the lion uh, togra, the one, lion that chased you guys through the whole entire building. Yes. And was crashing through the walls. Was he really that aggressive? Like on normal days while you guys were filming and living there, or was he rather calm? He was a wonderful lion, but everybody changes personality depending on the circumstances. So when we wanted him to tear through those uh, the walls and just really, really, I mean, like he and he was he was not acting because they didn't take direction very well. <laughs> he wanted to eat us, but the reason he wanted to eat us is because uh, we would put a female lioness. Uh, off camera in a little holding cage and so he wanted that female and so she was only about 10 15 feet away from us so what I would do is when when we set up the shot and we want the lion to come through and tear down the the door I just knock on the door and say I'm gonna take her away from you and he'd like try to attack us I told him I'd end so he'd do that and then we'd go to the next room and then we'd move her to the next room and then we just did that all the way around but otherwise, you got rid of her, and then he was a nice guy. <laughs> hey, uh, you first, you guys who asked a question, Jealous, you guys can you come know. up here and grab one of these posters. Uh, yeah, who else got a question? Way in the back, in the center there. The wavy, handy one. Okay, I have a question about the elephants. <laughs> Where did the elephants come from? And when they were, like, destroying the boat and the barrels, did they, re did they really do that? What's the story on the elephants? No, I talked to him privately and asked him if he could do it just for me. The elephants came, uh, uh, I think uh, Timbo, the, the male bull came from uh, Canada, and then Kura came from a circus, I think it was Circus Vargas, and we found out later on that they were uh, from the same uh, herd in Africa. Found that out like 20 years later. What, and the reason that uh, uh, he destroyed the boat <clears throat> is, we couldn't, this, the script was loosely written, but we tried to write things in that, uh, that the animals would normally do. Like we figured out that lions and tigers like to chase motorcycles. Uh, lions and tigers like to chase people that are afraid and run and show fear. <laughs> so that's the plot of the movie. And then, uh, How the fuck did someone find out that lions and tigers like to chase motorcycles? I was riding the motorcycle and I saw them all chasing. Wow, that's... And, and they also There's a movie here! And they also chase bicycles. Um, but so with the, with the, uh, uh, the boat, um, it was because of the, the aluminum camper shell that uh, he, he liked throwing stuff up that was really big that he could like, he, it was like bigger than him, but he could toss it around. So we figured out that they like to do all this stuff. And also they like to destroy stuff. So you can figure those things out. That's why the house at the end. <laughs> you can come up and grab a poster if you want. Uh, yeah, we're on the right there. So I noticed that the director of speed was the director of photography. Yes, yeah. crazy Ann. Well, he, he, he's also um, known for being pretty temperamental on set, so I was wondering what he was like. To That's polite. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, with all this, I mean, it, tell us a little bit about what it's like to work with him on this. If you notice in the credits, I was like a the camera operator and they, they taught me to be an assistant cameraman. And the reason that I was asked to be an assistant cameraman, it was a friend of mine, there was a camera operator. He said, John, I, you're really good with distances because I built the ranch. So, and we never got focus marks. So I was really good at guessing distances. So he wanted me to pull focus. But the main reason was I could pull focus and I had a hog cane and, and if I wasn't in the shot, I could like protect us and make sure we didn't get bitten. That's why I was an assistant cameraman. But uh, I would never assist John because he's so intense and he is an amazing cinematographer. And that's why it's amazing. It looks like he was shot three years ago, not 40. But uh, um, I remember uh, about three weeks into filming, 
the, the dad's uh, hand bite was uh, like the first one or first or second day. And then three weeks later, we were do, because we had to shift scenes, and so we do the family coming down the, the steps, and we get in the rowboat, and the lions come running down, and they, they're uh, running down the shoreline, the lionesses, and Jan, we shot everything with three or four cameras, and so we disguised Jan's camera. He, we dug a hole for him to be in, and we, he wanted a green, we had a green parachute over him to blend him in the grass, and so he could shoot the lionesses jumping over him, and then when he had an empty frame, he panned over to get the family. Well, when I, when I, because when when I wasn't acting, I was doing other stuff, and so I prepped the scene because I, I don't all I have to do is go down the stairs and get the boat, so I don't need much prep for as an actor, and so I said, Jan, we got this special helmet because it was the first three weeks of filming. I said it's cut out so you can operate the camera and, and uh, you can have a football helmet to project you, and he goes, I don't need any ficking helmet. <laughs> and I go, okay, whatever. So uh, we cover him and. Uh, and so I'm in the boat acting. I look over and this, the last lioness that jumped over him, he has an empty frame, so he pans over and gets the family. Well, think about it from a lioness. She's like, dup, 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 dup. she jumps over and she sees this green parachute move. And there's something moving that she doesn't know what it is. She, she goes over and she bites it. <laughs> 200 stitches in the head. So he's on his way to the hospital, and I'm thinking, okay, so we, we better get another DP. So we start calling our backup DPs, and Jan came back four days later, and he stayed there for five years of filming. The guy's amazing, I mean, uh, but he won't talk about the film either. Nobody will talk about the film. Why won't he talk about it? Does something about traumatic and head wounds or something. <laughs> it was, and also it delayed his career because he thought he was only going to work for nine months and took him five years. <laughs> was he mad he got hurt? or We were never mad that we got hurt. Uh, but he, was he like mad that he couldn't keep shooting? Because he seemed to the kind of... No, because he came right back, so it was fine. Uh, you can come grab a poster if you want. Uh, right up front. Yeah, how cool was it to... Uh catch the uh, footage of that line learning how to skateboard and did you let him keep the skateboards? <laughs> okay, on the skateboard scene, we, we tried to encourage, and this, this uh, what we were doing, we were raising him in Sherman Oaks with us. Um, we always got caught. You shouldn't do it. Uh, the wild animals, you should never do it. But we encouraged all of our friends, and we loved getting new friends where we'd go, okay, you want to raise a lion cub? And so they were raised all over because we, we had a lot of cubs that kept getting born and you, you'd want them to be raised by people because if you left them with the lions, they became wild. So one of my friends, uh, they had a skateboard, they had a kid with a skateboard and this lion taught, taught themselves how to ride a skateboard. And so we tried filming it and we ran out of time and Tippy came to the crew and she said, I really love uh, watching a lion ride a skateboard. And she asked like 20 of us, she says, can we film on our day off? Well, now we work six days a week. We only get one day off, but it was like, sure, Tippy, whatever you want, because we love Tippy. And so we all took our day off. Tippy directed that scene, and that scene wouldn't have been there except that we took our day off and then let Tippy do her thing, and, and so that's what it was. Right. Yeah, somebody else? Yeah, right here. Was that a lighter in the scene towards the end? It was a tie gun. See, the difference between a lion and a tiger is that there's science on you. So, but, but they look similar. A tigon is the, the father always comes first. I love saying that because it pisses women off. And so the, it's a tigon. And if the mother, if the father's a lion, it's a liger. And so we had a tigon. We tried for years. Um, and my, the tiger that I raised was the father. I was very proud of that because that was Marina Del Rey, the single scene. Ted and Tippy lived in the suburbs and their, their tigers that they raised didn't do that. But so, uh, Noel was the tigon. She was sterile. We thought she would be sterile like a mule. So she wasn't on birth control pills. It was nearing the end of the film. So we didn't need any more cubs. We were trying to like cut the numbers down because it was costing way too much money and we were out of money. But she bred with a tiger. And so we had a Thai Tigon. Look it up, Google Thai Tigon. There's only one in the world. It shows up as Shambhala and Tippy Hedren. And we got to name it. We sat around at Sunday dinner one night and said, well, we get to name it. And so we called it. And so that's the only Thai Tigon in the world. But the, the Noel, she only spoke uh, Tiger, which is chuffing. They go, <laughs> but 
<laughs> Nathaniel, the tie tie guy, he spoke both. So he'd go row like a lion and <laughs> so he spoke both. He was more like uh, half half. Oh my God. That is the most incredible answer I've ever had to what I thought was a stupid question. <laughs> it's the only one in the world who could ever ask the question, and who would be able to answer it? Yeah, right here. Uh, so the location, was that your actual house? I lived in that house uh, for the first three months that I took over the, uh, the project, but no, that was not the home we lived in. That was built for a set designed after a house in Mozambique. But it was on your estate? Estate, it was on the, uh, I call it the ranch, Tippy calls it the preserve. Okay, okay. Yep, in the back. Uh, yes, I was curious, um, was there anyone, uh, did you have advisors from the outside, whether it was locals or uh, veterinarians, zookeepers, or, or did you just wing it? Well, we had veterinarians that would come out and, and do some things. I mean, like, you know, uh, x-rays and d diseases and things. I did a lot of the, uh, because there wasn't enough money, I did a lot of the veterinarian with shots and blood tests and things like that. Which, like, I don't know why I was qualified to do these <laughs> things, but I've just never been, I just do whatever, because I figure, but shit, if somebody else can do it, I should be able to do it. Um, but no, it, it, all the experts, because we were supposed to use uh, trained lions, uh, all the supposed experts, they said, you can't have two full-grown male lions together. So we kind of showed them that you could. Right. But yes, we could, but yes, a lot of people get hurt. So maybe we were both right. Right, right. <laughs> we're both wrong. <laughs> Agree to disagree. Uh, yeah, over here. What happened to all the animals after the production ended? They retired and they lived out their lives there. Unfortunately, the way that it was supposed to be was we had it in the budget of the movie that they we left enough money in there that they would just die of old age and retire and everything be fine. Because the film went, uh, it was supposed to be nine months, it went five years, three million, 17 million. There was nothing left at the end of the film. So God bless Tippy, she turned it into a nonprofit organization and she raised money and she took care of them until they all died off. But then, uh, I, I think it was about 10 years later, she, uh, she started getting rescuing animals. And I was the first, I was like the voice of reason, which is, it sounds very strange. Um, but I said, Tippy, you shouldn't get any more because this is gonna go on forever. And, um, and so, but that's her life and, uh, and she's passed bills and, you know, so it's great. But uh, no, they all, they were, all well taken care of. Yeah, somebody else have one? Yeah, right in the middle. Sorry, I've been neglecting you. Um, can you speak a little bit about the 72 injuries and what was your favorite and what was the worst? <laughs> what was my favorite injury? <laughs> I really didn't like that guy. So no, happy that he got hit by a tiger. Now, occasionally, do, don't we say that that question maybe might not be appropriate? Favorite injury, I think. Uh, I'll pass on that one. Um, most exciting. <laughs> You're using really just the shittiest terms to describe people with life-threatening animal wounds. Excuse the pun, but throw me a bone, man. Give me something that I can answer. Most exciting. What, I mean, what, what was what was the most tragic? Like, what was the scariest uh, injury that you guys had on set that that made everybody stop? Because I mean, you would be like, oh, they nipped us, or like, oh, we got a canine, like okay, we'll go to the hospital. Okay. But which one was the one where like maybe this is a bad idea? I got one that might answer kind of both of them a little bit. So. The there was an assistant director by the name of Doran Cowper, and um, I didn't get along with him too well. He's kind of a dick, but uh, um, and he, 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 his attitude was all wrong. But at any rate, uh, he was the worst injury, and so he got bitten in the throat, and a, a canine punctured his windpipe, and very, very dangerous. And we went in and we grabbed him, and we were taking him out. And the lion, a uh, full grown male lion, came in and bit him in the ass on the way out. <laughs> so that was kind of both. He was a dick. <laughs> but he lived. It was fine. <laughs> yeah, it didn't right, work after that. Right, right, right. So, with such a long production time and so many injuries on set, how many of the crew members that started the project finished the project? Three. Oh. <laughs> I mean, crew? Yeah. I think three. Um, Jan, uh, Nathan, 
maybe one crew. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the cast. Uh, well, uh, this is kind of tangentially involved, but I so I just walked. Uh, okay, that deserves a t-shirt. Uh, let's give this man a t-shirt. Because I have never, we went through, somebody asked me how many, they've asked me how many people worked on the film. And I mean, we, we didn't, we didn't sit down and go, okay, so we're gonna make this movie, it's probably gonna take five years to make. Let's keep a record of how many people get bitten, and let's take a, keep a record of how many people get hired. I mean, the record keeping was atrocious. Everything was, it was just like, it was amateur hour. We didn't even have walkie talkies on the movie, so it was like, forget it. I mean, it's just everybody's recollection. But my best guess is that 900 people worked on the film. I know one day in particular that 14 crew guys quit on one day. 14, the whole grip department, uh, most of the electrical department, three of the camera department, they all just said, this is insane. It's the most unprofessional, stupid thing we've ever seen. And we're out of here. Well, what's amazing is, uh, you, so uh, John directed this documentary called The Making of Roar, and in it, it has the 25-year reunion, correct? And in, in one of the scenes, that they're all gathering at Shambhala again, and you see a bunch of the crew guys looking at a board where all the crew members, I guess, had written all of their names, and there are guys that are coming to work, they're like, holy shit, that dude worked on it? Yeah, and like another guy's like, yeah, I worked on it for like eight days, and then they're just like literally going through a checklist of people who worked on all these like huge movies that worked on Roar for like seven days. Yeah, it, it, was, it was only the camera department so whenever we, we started because it was the loading room and so everybody would write their name down <laughs> and so it just went on and on and on but some of the guys went on to be really famous there was one guy that uh, uh, he, he uh, was the DP of bird on a wire and I did a commercial with him like 10 years after roar and uh, I met him on the stage and uh, we were pre lighting and he, he says John you know uh, we work together and I said, oh, I'm sorry, I worked with a lot of people, and I, I have bad memory for names. And he says, I said, what did we work on? He says, Roar. I said, oh. I said, um, um, how long were you on Roar? He goes, um, oh, just a couple hours. <laughs> I said, oh. I said, well, uh, uh, my rule was, unless you work 30 days, I didn't learn your name, so I'm sorry, Bob, I don't remember. And I said, why did you only do a couple hours? He said, well, so I was a camera operator, not a DP, but I was, I was a camera operator. And so uh, it was about uh, just early on in the filming. And so, uh, you know, you disguised all the cameras and you got everything all ready and we rolled and, and like 15 minutes later, uh, um, Jan got uh, bitten in the head and, and he got scalped and, and he got 200 stitches in the head and you, you fixed him up and got him off to the hospital. And he says, I remember I walked up to you because it looked like you were in charge and, and said, uh, so I'm not gonna work on the film. And he said, so what you said was, uh, oh, th this isn't normal. This is a bad day, so no, it's gonna be fine. And he said, you know, I'm sorry. This he says, I already heard that your father got bitten the first day. This is three weeks into filming. The DP's on his way to the hospital. It looks really bad. He goes, I don't, this isn't for me. I'm not that type of person. And I said, okay, we'll just go out to the front office and get a check. And he goes, I don't want any money. Just take the money and give flowers to that poor guy. Good luck, you need it. <laughs> yeah, somebody else have a question? Yeah, in the middle here. So on the, like the scenes when the, the, the lions were getting killed, um, I mean, there's not just that scene, but several scenes. It almost seemed like they were slightly trained. I, mean, I know they were wild, but you guys lived with them for a long time. And I heard before filming, like, you, you know, they were calm. It was just when you sh pretended to show fear, they got crazy. Like, how, how much were you able to, like, get them to do a scene for you? Well, if you're talking about when they got shot, yeah. well, that's, uh, they don't play dead like a dog. Yeah. Uh, so on those scenes, and we would never hurt our animals. We don't. We, there was never an animal tranquilized, except for those scenes. But we only did it because we had to tranquilize them once or twice a year anyway to take blood samples. So, and typically I would do that. I don't know why I was qualified, but I, I was like really good at giving shots to the lions and not getting bitten. So, because all you have to do is like. Uh, if, if you know anything about animals, if you hurt an animal, they turn around and they bite whatever's hurting them. So if, if you give them a shot, they try to bite you, they bite the needle. But if you hold the needle in a syringe like this, and you pat them really hard on the butt, and then you just zap them, and then 95% and of the time they don't bite you. So I gave them a shot and to anesthetize them so that we could then do a blood sample, because we had to do that annually anyway. And so when they were kind of like really nodding off, I was up on the, the flat part and I just like 
when it was the right time, I just push them over. <laughs> and then they have that great look in the eye, like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's like they're dying, but they're stoned. <laughs> Uh, this was, stupidest this, thing I've ever heard. This was learning on the job. <laughs> hey, we're gonna do these lying death scenes. Why don't we just shoot him with a needle and push him off a hill? Hey, man. Get you in the pot. He'll film the shit out of that. Uh, we got time for a couple more questions, so be sitting on your hands. Uh, yeah, right here. Um, what was your relationship with the local community, and how did they feel about all the lions? Half of them loved it and half of them hated us. Because <laughs> they used to get uh, loose about once a year. <laughs> right after you stuck them with a needle? <laughs> no, no, because they're high the tigers sleep. running around no, the neighborhood. Uh, that's uh, uh, a bunch of people are asking me to write my memoirs, which I think is stupid because I don't think I'm a celebrity. I don't think there's any, but people like my stories. But uh, so it, that would take like uh, an hour and a half to answer that question of, of all the people that were pissed off about the lions that got loose. But uh, most of the neighbors liked it. Did you have like any famous neighbors that were just like, oh, that's that sounds just their lion. No, no famous neighbors. Uh, yeah, somebody else. Yeah, right in the back. Um, which animal was your favorite to work with and why? My personal favorite of one in particular was Nikki, and he was one of the tigers that rode in the car. And I raised him from five pounds and, and two weeks old. And, you know, I mean, he, he was a 700 pound Siberian tiger. He was, my father called him the d most dangerous animal on the, on the ranch. Dad was, the, that was probably the only animal he was kind of afraid of because Nikki just, he nailed him a couple times. Oh. And I think he knew that my father was not very nice to a, a lot of people on the crew in the, in the family. And Nikki always protected me. He never, I mean, I love that guy. He popped four water beds when he was growing up, <laughs> which you'd think after two, I would have figured that out. But it was the 70s, man. <laughs> one, one time, I have some friends over and, and I, I, I like, we're watching TV and there's like five or six of us over and I like, watch the TV, look at the tiger, watch TV, look at the tiger, look over and go, shit. So I run back. Nikki could open a door faster than you could, and he had just figured out how to do it. He jumps up with both his paws, and he goes like this. He pushes in the door. So I go in, and he's, he's on the waterbed laying down, and he has both his paws in front of him, and he's bit in the waterbed, and he's, because he weighed about uh, 250 pounds at the time. So he's, he's got a, a, a thing of a spout of water coming up about that high, and he's like licking at the water. <laughs> Put the biggest smile on his face. I walk over and go, wham! <laughs> Nikki, stop that! So then I went and got a new waterbed, but they, they gave me the third and fourth ones for free because I brought Nikki with me on the third time. <laughs> went into the waterbed store. <laughs> I have this XK Jaguar that they just shit themselves in front of you like, whoa, no, 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 we don't want tigers do the water beds. Well, no, I went in and made sure there was no customers and then, and then, because they knew when There's I bought the water beds. When I bought the <laughs> water bed, I said, I said, listen, I said, can I get a discount because uh, my tiger bit? And they go, yeah. So they gave me a discount. So the third time I figured they wouldn't give me a discount. I needed more show and tell. So I brought Nikki in and he just jumped from one water bed to the next to the next. And they thought it was so funny they gave me one. It was that, great. That should have been a commercial. <laughs> You're a commercial director, John. Commercial for water, water beds. Well, I mean, uh, your home life with animals, like, are you constantly kind of on your toes? Like, what is steak night like at your house? Do you just have to guard your food? Like, <laughs> If anybody has looked at any of the pictures, there was a Life magazine shoot in the 70s. Um, and it was a big spread, and it's very famous. And tippies with, uh, you see Melanie in bed with a full-grown lion in our house in Sherman Oaks and a bunch of other pictures. But there's this great picture where we're, uh, all having dinner, the family's having dinner. <clears throat> Tippy has set crystal candles, and she she really classy Hollywood lady, and the table looked immaculate. And uh, there's a full grown lion, uh, and there's a banister behind me, and I'm feeding the lion uh, meat, so that he's looking over the banister. It's a nice, nice picture. And the photographer from Life Magazine goes, "Okay, I need to change. Uh, I'm out of film. I'm reloading." And so I figured I'd stop feeding the lion. And uh, Neil looks over at uh, all the food on the table, and he jumps over the banister 
and the picture's great because he he pushes me over this way, tip me over that way, lands on the dining room table with candles lit and crystal and everything, breaks the dining room table, crashes into dad, and just takes everything with him. But the life photographer, he had two cameras, and one of them got the picture, and even two pictures of the thing. So if you look it up, I think Life Magazine, and you can probably find Google the thing. It's a great picture. You know, so whenever you have lions and tigers and jaguars and everything living in your house, like, do you just have the most disgustingly large kitty litter box? Like, what is, where does all that poop go? This is my smart question for the night, by the way. What happens with all of the poop, John? <laughs> just pick it up, and they didn't use a kitty litter box. <laughs> yeah, somebody have a, we probably have time for one last question. Yeah, you. So, do you, have you ever had like this normal I had that when I was young, and I even had a couple cats after I uh, did the movie, but now I don't have a goldfish. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Uh, Jan DeBunka, you won that shirt. You can come up and get it. Uh, but thank you guys for coming. Tell your friends to watch Roar. John, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to have you here. And thank you so much for showing up. I, I tell your friends because I, I, on the big screen, it's so much more fun. <laughs>